Welcome back, everyone. So nice to be here today with Erin Lolito, editor of Wild Roof Journal. Welcome, Erin. Thanks, Becky. It's good to be joining you today. Yeah, sure. Erin is joining us from Buffalo, New York. How are things in Buffalo right now? Is it is it cold yet? A little bit. We're in the the autumn in between. It was great yeah. Sunday. It was a great day to be outside. Since then, it's been kind of windy and rainy. And, um, oh, yeah, winter. It'll be on and off and on and off for a little bit until we make the full turn right, into right. the colder weather. <laughs> Well, welcome. We're so glad you could be here. Um, everybody tuning in, thanks so much for coming out. As always, if you have any questions, just go ahead and type them into the chat and I will work them into the conversation with Erin. Um, so let's jump right in. Tell us uh, when did you, are you one of the original founders of the magazine and when did you create it and why? Yes. So yeah, it was um, my idea originally just uh, coming out of basically a desire to work with other creative people and to, to be embedded in some kind of creative community. Um, at the time, um, I started it around 2020. So in kind of the fall 2019, I was mm. I was kind of accumulating some some ideas and wondering what to do about them. And at that time, I was interested in visual arts, and I have a background in, in writing and literature going back to, you know, to my education, but I, I kind of had this kick on visual art and photography, and I was interested in somehow merging them and finding other people who are interested in merging them. So my initial starting point was kind of submitting, just, you know, submitting my work to get published, and Mm -hmm. And doing that for a while. And one morning, a light bulb went off. And I said, well, what if I did something like that, you know, from the other side? What if I started my own thing to collect other people's work instead of submitting my own mm -hmm. um, and going through that process? So that was that was the, the origin point was just that that light bulb moment of like, could I actually do this? Um, and that began kind of the steps to prepare like a website and some of it just the the logistics of how to collect submissions and go through, sure. um, go through that that starting point. So you're one of these pandemic-born <laughs> lit mags, or pre. I, it seems like almost pre-pandemic. Once that hit, did that um, fortify your decision to go ahead and do this, or was it the opposite? Was it like, oh God, what did I take on here? Yeah, the, the first, the first one. Okay. But yeah, yeah, exactly. So that the 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 formulation actually took place, you know, officially before COVID. Um, I think my the, the website went live, I believe, uh, the day after Christmas, twenty nineteen, December twenty oh, sixth. Wow. <laughs> so um, I, I was kind of ready to to at least make it live and see what happened. Um, so yeah, it was it was just that that time I, I really wanted to to find a digital mode um, because it as uh as somebody who doesn't have a background in visual art it got really annoying to like carry things around and, like i have to go to a gallery that's 45 minutes away just to drop something off and drive back like this is kind of annoying uh, even though it was very an, an enriching and, and really enjoyable experience that to, to go through that there are these kind of elements of like i gotta carry this thing uh around for you know and then pick it back up and all these like these things that visual artists just kind of do by second nature. For me, it was like a little bit, um, I need something to work around here. So digital was definitely part of my plan. Mm -hmm. And then to answer the second part, yeah. So once pandemic life hit, it was that opportunity to like dig in and say, yeah, I think I really do like this and I wanna, I wanna invest more time and more energy into it because it, even at the beginning, there was a catch. There, there were people seeing it. There were people submitting. Mm -hmm. So almost immediately, I knew that there were people out there who wanted to to connect and to to share their stuff. Mm -hmm. So I said, "Yeah, let's roll with it." Yeah. So you're a photographer, and are you also a painter? Not so much painting. I do a little bit of drawing just for fun. 
Um, but most of the stuff that I was uh, referring to, like submitting and going through the gallery stuff was uh, photography and uh, digital art. Mm -hmm. And so you, so the magazine accepts uh, photography, drawing, painting, and also fiction, poetry, and nonfiction as well? Yeah, so I try to keep it pretty open mm -hmm. and kind of encourage the cross crossing over and if the hybrid work is always kind of interesting mm -hmm. um, just because my, my very first starting points were images that included text in them. So that was mm -hmm. kind of my crossover from writing to visual art. Um, so hybrid works and yeah, exactly like you said, any, any form of visual art, um, creative nonfiction, fiction and poetry. Mm. So are there challenges to publishing or uh, printing visual art? Like, do you ever come across works that are submitted where you're like, man, this is so beautiful, but it's not going to transfer on the web? Like, if I saw this in a gallery, I would love it, but we, it's just not going to work. That's a good point. Yeah, the uh, three-dimensional work comes to mind at first. Mm -hmm. So things like sculpture and other, other forms of three-dimensional art. Um, having good photography, like art photography is uh, import, extra important in those cases, mm -hmm. um, in addition to obviously having a good high quality photographs of things like paintings. Um, so those are, are sometimes challenging. Um, I wonder if sometimes um, just the other photography thing comes into play of like if, mm -hmm. if there is a little bit of shadowiness in the in the original image sometimes you can work around it and and work a little tr couple of tricks in the photo editing but sometimes mm -hmm. they're a little bit um tough to do that with sure so it's interesting because i know there are obviously a lot of literary magazines that publish that print artwork um, but they don't necessarily focus on artwork. The art is sort of like just there to accompany the other stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. some, I mean, some, many magazines have art editors. They they are interested in visual art, but I think I would say more often than not, it's not really the focus of the journal. Um, but it sounds like with your magazine, it's equal parts visual art, if not mostly visual art. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's uh, one of the selling points, I would say. Um, I think it's true. And just, you know, it's not even a bad thing just to say, like, it, you know, a lot of uh, literary mags um, are mostly writing and maybe there's a few paired pieces or maybe there's a couple of visual pieces that are um, that feel a little bit kind of thrown in or just mm -hmm. interspersed. So one, yeah, one of the things that I, I really uh, wanted to focus on even from the very beginning was pretty much a level playing field of, of the visual art and the writing. And in terms of number of pieces, the writing, there's gonna be more writing. I think just the nature of who submits work to, to websites like this, I think there's more writers submit and as mm -hmm. far as the, the number of submissions, that's the way the numbers go. Um, but in terms of the presentation of it, yeah, exactly. So it, I, I set it up on the website, um, if you look at the, the issues on wildroofjournal.com, um, I set them up as galleries. So mm. I try to have a digital gallery in the sense of each piece, whether it's a visual, a poem, a prose piece, has its own space. And it's, that's probably equally divided, you know, evenly between, between each work. And so I, I just, I love that concept. And it kind of gives, each piece that gets published, a little bit of breathing room and hopefully the, the viewer or the reader an opportunity to, to, uh, to spend, you know, an appropriate amount of time, whatever they feel uh, is, is necessary to enjoy the piece. Mm -hmm. If somebody, and in fact, I, I know that we have a couple newsletter readers that are working on projects that combine drawing and text, how should they submit that to you? Is that considered an image or a poem, or should they just decide and <laughs> send it along and see what happens? Yeah, good question. For me, my preference, it's not a, a huge deal, but uh, the guideline, I would say, like if you're submitting a, a Microsoft Word file or a text mm -hmm. file, mm -hmm. submit it in the poetry section. If you're submitting okay. a, an image file, a JPEG or something, 
and submit it to the art file. Mm -hmm. um, but there are times, and I, I believe with the, the upcoming issue in November, uh, first week in November, it, it'll be released. Uh, there are two, um, two contributors who have a visual piece, a standalone visual piece and a poem. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not necessarily paired like together as one piece, but they're just a contributor who does both things. And I felt that both pieces were, were, were worth publishing. So in those cases, I mean, it's two separate things really. Yeah. So that's kind of, the, I like a little bit of that messiness. Sometimes that's part of the appeal. Like, what is it? Is it more of this and more of that? Yeah. Um, I'm kind of willing to 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 uh, dwell in that in that question a little mm -hmm. bit. So for my sensibilities, uh, if you call it a poem, I'll trust you. If you call it a visual piece, I'll go with that. Sure, that actually relates to my next question, which is how do you try to get the pieces to talk to one another within a single issue? Is that necessary? Do you find yourself rejecting work you like just because it doesn't communicate with other pieces in the issue? What, how does that all play out? Yeah, that's my favorite thing actually mm -hmm. is uh, putting and organizing and synthesizing the work that is submitted or the work, I'm sorry, that's accepted for an issue. So uh, to answer your direct question, typically no, I don't um, think of and and you know the readers I work with don't think of a piece in a negative sense as like oh it's not going to fit with what we already have accepted mm -hmm. um so basically the acceptance process would be collecting whatever came through and when we fill you know typically maybe around 40 or so contributors per issue give or take um but once we fill the amount of space we think is um is what we're looking for. That's what we got for the issue. So at that point, that's kind of what I described as my favorite part, because then it's the game of like putting the puzzle pieces together. Mm -hmm. And you don't quite know what you got until you say, okay, these 40 pieces, let's start, you know, going through them and seeing what connects with what, and where, mm -hmm. what are the stronger ones you feel like, mm -hmm. what are the ones that maybe fit in between different pieces, mm -hmm. uh, what are the ones sometimes, are, you know, you might have a strong piece that seems like a good ending. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily mean that got pushed away. It's just the last thing, but sometimes it's a good place to end. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean the things that are first are strongest. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. the things that are last are weakest. And to have that kind of flow and continuity, um, if people notice that, that makes me the happiest when people say, oh, I just everything just flowed one piece to the next. So again, I'm thrilled because that's that's a that's a role I I tend to take on in my yeah kind of like in my on my own kind of like that's my kind of like little play area of uh, <laughs> just maybe listening to some music and like right have a little notepad right like I got a little notepad here I'll just sit a sheet of paper and and start playing so it's part partially intuitive just because mm -hmm. you can't necessarily look at forty pieces all at once and say have a have an overall view it's just like okay. Mm -hmm. what goes where so sure. uh, for me that's big um, yeah. not, not every publication emphasizes that mm -hmm. um, and that's fine too but uh, I, I just I love that concept mm -hmm. have you seen themes emerge sort of accidentally in issues yeah <laughs> <laughs> sometimes accidentally sometimes some somehow intentionally um the, the the obvious one is seasonal themes mm. um but that one that is, is a little more intentional um so you, you might have um an issue coming out like i said in november not every piece is going to connect with the seasonal theme of that time of year but there's going to be a, a, a common thread for sure mm. um so the one that stands out for me is maybe a, a a favorite in a way, even though the theme was a little bit on the darker side, it was last January's issue, January 22. Um, so that that one came together, and when I was when I was putting it together, it was a combination of the work that was accepted and like my personal life and just this mm. intertwining of like I couldn't separate what I was going through mm. from putting together 
putting together the pieces and the issues. So that one was one that stands out as like, oh, this is like, you can't avoid it at that point. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so uh, and as far, as far as that time of year, that's kind of the, the theme of that time of year, even if uh, I was in a better place at, at, in mm -hmm. my personal side, putting it together, that's kind of, it fits. Mm -hmm. So everything, you know, kind of uh, melded nicely in a way, and I could look back at it and say, yeah, that was a, that was an interesting experience, and that was um, even just the, an enriching experience to go right. through. That's interesting. I've never really considered how sometimes literary magazines can sort of be an expression of the editor's own kind of personal experience. Like, do you notice that you're drawn to particular works? This is also sort of a larger question about your editorial process. Um, who else reads work? What kind of communication you have among the other editors? But do you notice that like, you know, if you're going through something, you're maybe drawn to more to darker work or that the the work that you tend to accept is a reflection of your kind of own subjective experience. Yeah, wonderful. That's, that's such a good question, too, because there are common themes and maybe not theme isn't the right word, but there's kind of some common like sensibilities or common aesthetics uh, in some of the pieces we accept. And I think the the, the readers and other editors I work with um, more or less share, you know, share some of those. So there's not a lot of like tense, you know, dis strong disagreements on like what's a good poem, what's not a good poem. Mm -hmm. um, usually there's there's a pretty, uh, pretty collaborative effort. And if uh, if a reader says they feel really strongly about something, I can't think of a time where I've like had the complete opposite view. Um, so that that usually works pretty smoothly. And in terms of the aesthetic, um, I like a lot of accessible is important, but also like very late. So there, there is like a, a balance to strike um, between something that is feels like a genuine expression of, mm -hmm. of somebody. Like I like kind of feeling the writer on the other side, feeling like there is somebody trying to express something important. Um, and also the sense that it's not just maybe um, a simple expression. I kind of tend more toward complex and layered mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of themes, not necessarily the, um, the format. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives a, a little bit of a sense. I've been uh, I've been been reading some of uh, Ada Lee Moan's po poems re recently, and uh, I'm a little bit late to the game. I've, I've known about her work, and I've known like it's good. And uh, I would like it if I really dug in a little bit deeper, but uh, just getting into those, I think that is kind of like comes to mind as like a, a good example of like so real mm. in, in a lot of her poems that I've, at least the ones I've come across in the past uh, week or so, and I've been getting into them, but also so deep. Mm -hmm. And there's such a simplicity in, in certain ways, but such complexity in, in other ways. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about some of the fiction that you've accepted and why it worked for you? Sure, yeah. Fiction, in terms of uh, what we've published, tends to be on the shorter side. So our guidelines are up to about 3,000 words. I'm not a word count stickler, um, but that's the guideline. Uh, what tends to get accepted and maybe it's just a, a somewhat a reflection of what gets uh, submitted. It tends to be in the maybe a thousand word, mm. thousand to two thousand. Um, and the fiction, and even it spills over into more of the creative nonfiction, those tend to be a little more directly tied to na nature themes. Um, the poems, maybe there's a little more room to have a, a few more poems that just have maybe nothing to do with nature on the surface. Uh, fiction tends to draw into some kind of um, natural themes. So one that comes to mind, uh, we talked about it uh, on one of the roundtables I hosted recently was called Fortson. That was the title of the short story. And 
answering the discussion we had about it, I didn't really know where it was going to go, but we ended up talking mm -hmm. about it for like 20 minutes. And uh, my partner, uh, co-host, colleague, Chris, um, had so much to say kind of about the, the archaeological aspect of and the digging, because there's kind of literal digging to find um, materials and then kind of getting this the symbolism of it. So that was one that stood out as like that just hit like all the right spots in the uh, in the fiction sense because it was uh, personal. Um, it was nature themed, and there's kind of a strong sense of place and uh, connection to the natural world. Uh, and then I had like lots of deeper themes with like memory, personal history, family. So if you're kind of tying some of those threads together, that's uh, something that uh, is it's very appealing. Mm -hmm. uh, and having said that, you know, if it's a great short story about a, a breakup or a relationship or some kind of interpersonal interaction that's just captivating and it's not set in nature, like there's there's room for it. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be about trees and <laughs> and hiking. And stuff like that. So is nature is that like a preference that you? you'd prefer for the work to somehow have a connection to nature, but it's not necessary. Yeah, I would say it's a, it's a loose theme. And so it's one of those things, if you go through an issue, you're not gonna really avoid um, seeing a sense of the connection to nature, mm -hmm. but you know, on the micro level, not necessarily every piece um, is, you know, like mm -hmm. I said, <laughs> not every piece is describing some uh, walk through the woods. But there's a lot of pieces that describe walks through the woods. <laughs> <laughs> and are you open to pieces? Like, do they have to have a kind of peaceful relationship with nature or gentle relationship with nature? Are you open to pieces that have sort of an antagonistic or violent or, you know, frightening connection to nature? Yeah, I'm I'm open to it. Yeah, there, there's even a couple of pieces that just kind of jumped out that's, that I remember. Um, the Woods Inside is a poem that has that darker layer. It's just as, as one that I was looking at recently. That was from quite a while ago. Um, Olivia Lee Stogner, if I could do the shout out properly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I love the idea of, of the, the light and the dark. Mm. So I mentioned that the last January's issue, there's a lot of darkness in, in, in those pieces um, as a whole mm. and as a collection. So that fits the time of the year, right? So your, your winter solstice, your, your dark night of the soul, your, um, you know, St. Lucy's Day. Um, that's kind of, that was, that was the nature of the, that collection. In, in the July issue, there's going to be a little more lightness. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, th I think that that is kind of the appeal. And that's some of those partially intentional and partially not part, part of those themes that cycle. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about um, pieces that you reject and why, what are some common things that you see writers uh, not doing wrong, but maybe that will will get them rejected from your magazine? Sure. Um, there's Yeah, there's a couple of kind of general categories. Um, sometimes it is just a matter of like sensibility and aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're a writer who's re you know, maybe heavy on pop culture and maybe cultural commentary and more of like current events types mm -hmm. of content, it's going to be not, I wouldn't say like never make it make its way through, but it, it'll, you know, just the sensibility of Wild Roof Journal is mm -hmm. probably not the, the best fit for something in that category. Just as, as, as one that kind of, it's, it's, it's a worthwhile subject matter, mm -hmm. but it's not always going to fit best. Um, so there's, a, there's an aesthetic match. Um, I tend to recommend writers when they submit to have a, a variety of subject matter and maybe even style or formatting. Um, so if every piece in a submission is, you know, a, an eight line poem with, you know, two line stanzas or something where mm -hmm. it just feels, a, I mean, formulaic, so maybe a little bit strong, but if, if it just kind of seems like it's a similar thing over and over again, um, that's not as appealing on my end or, or mm -hmm. kind of on the on the end of the, the editor's 
than maybe a, a, a submission that has a little more variety, um, maybe a little variety in subject matter tone, um, even just the, the page, the formatting, the appearance on the page. So I think I, I usually recommend that, and I, I'm usually excited when I see a collection that has kind of keeps you on your toes a little bit, and you don't mm -hmm. feel like it's just you're reading this the same poem over again. Um, and then I mean, I think part of the the nature of the creative process is it's a huge learning experience for people starting out as well as people who've been doing it a long time. It it, it that's why it's such an appealing thing to me, is that it never stops being a learning experience. Sure. So, um, you know, where you're at now when you submit something, it just might not fit. It might mm -hmm. not be that the work that um, we're looking for. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad or it'll never change or something mm -hmm. like that. So I kind of have like a little bit of like a holistic sense, like, um, you know, even if somebody's just starting out, like that's just the, the way it happens. Sometimes you're going to have to submit for a while and feel it out. And mm -hmm. generally somebody will accept it at some point along the way. You keep at it and keep practicing right. and trying to, trying to improve it mm -hmm. and, and work with it. And it is a genuine expression, mm -hmm. something like that. Is this all to say that you encourage people to try the magazine again if they are <laughs> rejected? And if they do try again, should they wait six months or should they just send something out right away? Yeah, so that's that's a good question too. Um, we are open to submitters resubmitting. Um, ideally, right, they a, a submitter would have a, a sense of the of the match and it would be a relatively good match um there have been cases where a, a submission came through got declined a submission or two later got accepted so it's it's not like one declined submission means like you're done forever no matter how much you submit you're just mm -hmm. not gonna fit um i don't i don't uh treat it like that way and i try not to be like a gatekeeper kind of a editor figure um, I don't like that in, uh, I don't like, <laughs> I don't like that role. So, um, I don't, I don't see it like that. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's always welcome. And as far as timeline, I think as far as getting accepted and resubmitting, um, we like to keep at least an issue gap. Um, so we, we have an issue every other month. So we kind of the month to yeah, about six months, roughly speaking. So yeah, about like an issue gap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and do you have advice for writers about how to approach nature in interesting ways? Because I imagine you do see a lot of repetitive imagery, um, you know, leave, uh, trees without leaves <laughs> to evoke loss or a setting sun or, you know, are, are there things that you sort of um, can, is there advice you can offer writers for how to approach writing about nature in ways that are unique and exciting? I'll I'll give it a go. If I had the real answer, I would I would be using it for myself, but I'd probably be <laughs> telling anybody. I'd be, I'd be putting that into practice in my own writing. Um. So yeah, that is to say, like, there's not like. And a piece of advice or like a way to do it. Um, and that's what is so appealing or even admirable at times when I come across a poem with seemingly pretty standard imagery. Mm. Um, but it has something else going on. Mm. And that that's and that's it's really not about the imagery. It's really about what else is going on here. Mm. So, um, I, I, if if I'm offering advice, it's to focus on like what the either the emotion, the pathos, the experience that's being expressed, the uniqueness of the experience, um, and adding something unexpected. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a poem about a, a 
moonlight reflecting in the water. Right. Okay, that's a standard set of images. And I've written that image has been in some of my writing <laughs> to be fully <laughs> transparent. Um, but the, yeah, to, to make that unique, somehow unexpected, um, it could be the emotional connection, some kind of tangible uh, interaction, of uh, either interpersonal interaction or internal mm -hmm. um, subjective experience. So yeah, it's really about the what's trying to be expressed through the imagery sure um, as opposed to yeah you know. yeah so i imagine obviously the same thing is true for the visual art that it should um be loosely related to nature um and offer something unexpected some something that is kind of unfamiliar to you yeah absolutely so yeah there's a little bit of an element of balancing the familiar and unfamiliar yeah so um there was a time where i was more into experimental work and writing and stuff like that but those days are behind me so yeah that, that that the element of a little more of the accessibility and the familiarity that's all good especially in visual art too because there's there are a lot of um visual art pieces that are directly related to nature mm -hmm. um but then there's you know the ones that's stand out of you know, a little something interesting going on or something a little bit offbeat, um, something that could, you know, a little element more of dissonance. Mm -hmm. And th those are appealing, uh, appealing concepts to me that that, that element of, of contrast is always kind of, that's one of the engaging things for me. Sure. Um, and you guys have a podcast as well. Can you talk about that? Sure. Yeah, so I, I um, started that a while back. Um, I mentioned my colleague, Chris, Chris Vogt, uh, who is a friend, um, another English professor I've known for years. And we kind of, not directly, but we both had the sense of like, wouldn't it just be great and fun to talk about like literary things? Mm with other people and like having a <laughs> more of a group setting to do it as opposed to just maybe me and you or you know we're, we're, we've kind of heard each other's uh <laughs> repertoire of our favorites and all, and all that stuff so um i had the idea of uh, doing more of a roundtable format mm -hmm. so typically uh the podcast episode would be me chris and then at least one maybe one or two other uh, former contributors, mm -hmm. um, generally to the to the Wild Roof Journal, and then we pick um, some pieces that have been published recently. So uh, generally, I leave the selection process up to the guests because uh, I've already I've already selected them in, in one way or another in the sense of like um, seeing them before and and being familiar with them. So the guests will pick a favorite piece or two, and we just say, "All right, what did you like about it?" Um, so the intention with the discussion is really to celebrate these pieces, why they work, why we like them, why we connect with them. Um, even a little bit of a, what what do they do that I can do in my work too? Mm -hmm. So some of the tricks of the trade, like, oh, it's really neat that the, this, uh, like you said, this this image, the standard image of a, uh, you know, fallen oak tree really was done in such a, such a nuanced way. How do they do that? So it's kind of a, a multi-angled discussion on like, what do we like about it? What do we appreciate about it? How did it, how did it do it so well, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it's been fun to kind of have that back and forth. We do go on tangents. That's part of the fun. So it's not all, that's part of what um, our intention was as well. It's not all English class, kind of grad school level analysis and trying to be smarter than the other people in the discussion. Um, it's not that. It's just you know some some people who like this stuff mm -hmm. and just trying to have a good time. I know Chris yeah. usually calls it like a cocktail hour or something like that for um, for for English people. Um, so it, it it was just kind of came out of that. So usually we 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 have a some piece to to upload every month. Okay. Um, I'd love to do it more, but that's about mm -hmm. my limit in terms of the time <laughs> commitment for the podcast. So every month, um, there's a, a piece, a new episode. 
uh, to check out. And it's, you could go through any of the normal podcast apps um, as well as uh, through the website. There's a streaming uh, link on the website as well and YouTube. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned your time commitment. So that's actually my next question, which is something that I try to ask all editors, which is just how do you avoid burnout? Because we, uh, we were talking earlier, it sounds like you adjunct at multiple universities. Um, you're also a human being, I assume, with a life <laughs> beyond <laughs> beyond work and editing and all that stuff um, and the lit mag. Um, so how do you how do you manage it? Are there days that you feel like you can't and you don't want to do it anymore? And if so, what keeps you kind of doing this work? Uh, yeah, this would be a whole nother episode. I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's yeah that's huge mm. it's huge because um having a little bit of that perspective is so important so i think the the editing process and and the wild Roof journal in, in particular that project that's been so helpful for me just because that is a, a thing that um it brings me joy that in itself so even though there are tedious elements of it, I mean, come on, how could there not be? Um, when you're dealing with like posting things to a website and making, you know, making adjustments, responding to emails. Um, but ultimately there is that goal in mind. And, and that's why the each issue coming out um, is that, you know, it's it's a big deal on my end just to be able to put it out and to to um kind of appreciate everybody who collaborated and helped and all the contributors, obviously. Mm -hmm. So just that creative community aspect of it, I guess that's the buzzword that I fall on a, a, a lot, fall back on a lot. Um, having that sense of creative community, like this work matters to these other people. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm, I'm not just noodling around with my own, uh, my own poetry just to get it just right. Um, and Hopefully somebody sees it one day. Uh, there's a little more immediacy to it and and um, and mm. connection. Mm -hmm. So that kind of goes with um, that kind of goes with it. And then I think if I could spend more time walking in the woods, I would do this. Mm -hmm. um, that that's such an important point. So I, um, I should take my own advice, right? Like, <laughs> We all spending, should spend you know, take, more time in the woods. <laughs> spending more, yeah, exactly. Spending more time uh, outdoors and, and appreciating yeah. it in that way. What a difference when you when you have a day when you do that versus when you have a day where a week goes by and you don't. So having those little moments of of calm, mm -hmm. uh, um, stepping back, kind of getting a bigger sense, kind of keep trying to keep the right perspective, which is easier said than done. Um, and doing all the ordinary things, exercising, getting, getting enough sleep. Um, you can't, sleep? <laughs> can't say enough, can't say enough about those, those yeah. things. Um, but yeah, that, that, yeah, the biggest thing is kind of keeping active in, in a, in a creative sense. Mm. And like, I'll show you, so I, so I can find it. Like, I just always try to keep like a, even if it's messy, like, Oh wow! You know, a page in page in a notebook that's just like it's kind of like the, can you, the refuge. Sorry, can you hold that up again? It's just really visually cool. It's you don't have to do it that closely. Yeah. So those are that's notes for the magazine. No, that's just kind of my life mm. experience. Not <laughs> even not even so much life experience, but like when I hear things or I listen to a lot of mm -hmm. podcasts, uh, or if I come across something in something I read, and just just to well, somewhat randomly write things down mm. um keeping a notebook going has been has been good for me because then it's it just changes the, the whatever kind of mental process you're having when you could just mm. write something down okay move on mm -hmm. and it's not all it's not all poetry i'll tell you that yeah um, but it's just just that process of getting on paper is mm somehow does something when we're when we're thinking through something versus when we're writing mm -hmm, absolutely so have you noticed that the creative community around the magazine is growing 
Yeah, it's, you know, I use the phrase, pardon the phrase, but I say one freak at a time. <laughs> and just because it's it's um I use the word freak in the most loving way possible. Mm-hmm. And to me that that means it's you know it's not nothing's going viral over here. And I'm sure you, you can probably share that by posting your uh or maybe you have gone viral. I shouldn't speak for you. <laughs> um but but you know when when nothing goes viral when you post a poem to Instagram, mm-hmm. it's you get oh, maybe a little more than last time or sometimes a little less than last time. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, uh, as time goes by, you know, one other person connects and sticks with, um, keeps up, you know, keeps uh, submitting and keeping connected and checking out the podcast and doing some other things, the workshops. There's always some other little branches, little avenues that that we're trying out to um, to engage with our contributors. So, you know, not everybody that submits is going to be somebody who sticks around and engages to that extent. But Mm -hmm. Over the course of time, one here, one there, one there, one there. Um, so it's a slow process. It's gradual. But there's definitely a sense of growth and going somewhere uh, mm-hmm. that kind of keeps it keeps it engaging and keeps me invested for sure. Mm-hmm. Are there opportunities for people to get involved in the magazine? If they, if this all sounds great to them, they want to be part of the magazine, um, can they reach out and try to be a reader, uh, volunteer, editor in some capacity? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's always, I, I, I love when people um, offer to help. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, you know, I have a, a handful of people who are, in, in the process of either reading or helping in one way or another. Shout out to Anna and Rachel and Misty and Annie, um, along with um, Chris, who I mentioned, and and Erica and Keisha. I can't forget to shout out these people. Um, they've been super helpful. So yeah, anything, anything to help, I'm open to. Um, so if it's social media related, great. If it's as a reader, great. Um, if it's even something um, more in editing, copy editing, I, I, I could use a, a like-minded, um, you know, literary-minded, art-minded person. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a great, um, kind of a great way to engage and have a pretty good track record with people who have helped out in a volunteer basis getting mm-hmm. You know, in, in the grad school, getting a job, hmm. they usually, you know, obviously it's something you add to your, sure. to your credentials, to your resume, and it's always a, a, a extra good feeling when, you know, a, a reader or somebody who is uh, collaborating, um, gets a new program or gets gets a new job or something like mm-hmm. that. That's always, um, you know, it's not the reason to do it, but it's one of the perks. Mm-hmm. Sure. And so if people are interested, should they reach out to you directly? Sure, that sounds good. Uh, the Gmail, wildreefjournal at gmail.com. Um, that's the that's the direct way to uh, to connect. Okay. Uh, the Instagram account works too, Wild Reef Journal on Instagram. That's the main social media okay. uh, that I use. Mm-hmm. Twitter is a little bit less active, but there's <laughs> something in the works to be slightly more active on Twitter. Okay. And so how else should people get involved? Are you open for submissions right now? Are you open year round? What is the schedule? Yep, submissions we keep on a rolling basis. So generally they're always open. It's uh, a matter of where or when uh, something accepted will get placed. Mm-hmm. So if you're kind of in the whatever end of a cycle, um, it might be sooner. If you're at the beginning of the next cycle, cycle it might be a little bit later. Okay. But generally, the submissions would always be open. Um, and yeah, getting involved. Um, so there's the generally just accessing the issues on the website and checking out our uh, submitted, or I'm sorry, the accepted work. Mm-hmm. in our previous issues, um, podcasts, an extra way to engage social media. It's always good to get a couple extra numbers. I mean, mm-hmm. it doesn't hurt. Um, so Instagram and Twitter, uh, the YouTube page, and 
I do throw out some workshops. Um, um, so there's a couple there's a couple paid workshops that are available on the website, um, but I hopefully be starting a little bit of a like a poetry group um, again soon. Okay. Um, so there is a nice uh, little mini community of, uh, mm -hmm. of writers who are meeting in a poetry group. So like I said, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things to keep engaged and keep rolling. Right. If that isn't too confusing, I hope. <laughs> Not at all. Um, and so the next issue is coming out in November? Yep. Uh, first week in November, it'll be out. That's great. That's a very demanding publishing schedule for you guys. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I, uh, that's one of the, it, 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 it uh, started, I wasn't, I didn't know what, right. how challenging it would be, but I was like, okay, every other month, Yeah. for whatever reason, that's what I started with. And it's been a, a challenge to keep it up, but I mean a, a challenge in a good way in the sense yeah. of like it's doable, um, but it does push a little bit. Right. Um, so yeah, November would be the last issue in 2020. So that'll be the sixth issue of 20, or sorry, 2022. Right. Um, that'll be the last issue of this calendar year. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll be issue number 18, 17. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> yeah um and yeah so first week in november and i usually post to exactly post to instagram when that comes out that's great well thank you so much for taking the time and telling us all about this magazine everybody should get on this and submit the work if you have something uh loosely nature related visual art photography um get on this go to wildroofjournal.com and check it out thank you so much Aaron. This was fantastic. Thanks for inviting me, Becky. It was great. My pleasure.